Okay. okay. Okay, great. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. My name is Courtney Raj. I am an independent scholar, a freelance journalist, and a former advocacy director at the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, where we've worked quite a bit on the issue of uh, online content moderation. And I'm really delighted to welcome everyone to this session. And I want to ask everyone who's you know, here watching um, either on Twitter or here on the live stream to use the chat function uh, to hopefully engage with us, ask your questions. I will weave those in. Um, we are here for the panel, The Social Platform Dilemma, Governance Approaches to Moderate to moderate legal but objectionable content. And I think everyone here watching knows that content moderation has become a flashpoint as questions about how decisions are made, what role government should play and how self-regulation works have turned internet governance into a household topic of conversation. What should social media platforms be doing about content that is legal but objectionable, lawful but awful, content that offends or is considered hateful or violent and possibly misleading but isn't illegal in the United States? Some want government to force social media to do more and better content moderation, while others perceive a bias and want to force platforms to stop moderating. We are not going to get into the politics of these views, but rather their implications for content moderation and internet governance more broadly. Because even while policymakers are considering what, if any, role they should play in this issue, uh, new models of public-private partnerships, coordination have emerged, giving rise to a host of self-regulatory and co-regulatory models with various roles for the private sector, civil society, and government. So this is the focus of today's panel. We'll kick off first, however, by hearing from two people on either side of the debate over gov government's role in this topic, which recently flared up in Florida with the passage of SB 7072, which would have banned deplatforming of politicians and perceived viewpoint bias had it not been prevented from going into effect following a lawsuit alleging it violated the First Amendment and the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. So first, we're going to hear from James Taylor, president of the Heartland Institute, which supports the Florida approach, followed by Steve Del Bianco, president and CEO of NetChoice, which filed a lawsuit against the Florida law and won a preliminary injunction. They're each going to speak for three minutes, then they'll have two minutes each to respond. And then we're going to go directly to a stellar panel of experts and practitioners involved in various voluntary industry and multi-stakeholder efforts. I'm going to weave your questions in throughout. And then at the end, um, we're going to bring all of our panelists in to answer questions, including um, Steve and James. So we'll do an open Q&A at the end. So with that, James, over to you for three minutes. OK, thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, first of all, the Heartland Institute, we are a free market public policy organization. Our objective, our mission is to discover, develop, and promote freedom-oriented solutions to the problems that confront society. Uh, if you would have asked me uh, a year ago whether we would be squaring off with uh, net choice in state legislatures around the country, I would have thought that you were crazy because we have for so long championed and defended the rights of internet providers, of tech companies, et cetera where some folks have said because of their sheer size and reach that they need to be broken up. Uh, we've always advocated, and we still do, that size alone does not make an entity harmful, does not require breaking them up. However, during the past year, we have become very concerned, as have so many of the people that we work with uh, within Heartland, about some of the big tech companies that have attained a dominant market share, that have become, in effect, a common carrier, for the way people communicate and exercise our free speech rights and how they are, as you say, regulating content. Um, one thing I would like to note is we haven't come out in support of the Florida approach. As you said, we do support state legislators looking at and I think enacting protections for online free speech. We haven't come out for or against uh, specifically the Florida plan, but I think there are some many important things in that legislation uh, that other states can and should emulate and that I hope are upheld. Now, one thing that really jumps out at me is in the introduction, you mentioned how, uh, how we regulate, we being uh, tech companies and social media platforms, regulate, quote, objectionable content, and as you said, awful but lawful. Now, if this were simply uh, tech companies and media platforms 
uh, adhering to the spirit of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, I don't think we'd have an issue right now because Section 230 explicitly, it's called the Communications Decency Act, and it has a good Samaritan pr uh, provision that in its explicit examples of what is protected, the examples are all related to sexual obscenity, excessive violence, harassment. It's not a situation where uh, the tech providers who dominate the market can shut down people who question what the government says about the coronavirus origins, can shut down what climate scientists say about climate science, and can shut down conversations among users about social, political, religious topics, et cetera. So that is why we are involved. We're advocating for freedom. We would like to see the tech companies go back to the original mandate, and we'd be quite happy with that. Thank you, James. Steve, uh, over to you, three minutes. Hey, thanks, Courtney. Glad to be here. I uh, have several times heard James talk about the need for the public square, an online public square. And uh, anybody who wants an online public square that desperately should want the government to create its own. Uh, ask President Biden to create America's public square .gov because that's a far better way to create the online public square that James wants than trying to nationalize private businesses like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube and make them instruments of the government. James likes to uh, talk about the interplay between the First Amendment and Section 230, but the First Amendment is clear. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press. So the government cannot force newspapers or social media platforms to carry speech they don't want to carry. And as for the argument that our First Amendment can be discarded because social media platforms are the public square. We've had courts in America confirm over and over again, as in Prager, when the court said that despite YouTube's ubiquity and its role as a public facing platform, it remains a private platform. It is not a public forum that's subject to judicial scrutiny under the First Amendment. So look, I think the clear thing here is that the First Amendment protects social media platforms from Congress and from the state legislatures. It's not the other way around. The First Amendment was done 230 years ago this year. And Section 230 was only a 1996 legislative remedy because uh, the real life character in The Wolf of Wall Street had a lawsuit against Prodigy's bulletin board. More on that later, but 230 is not what's going on here. The confusion is rampant. Even the New York Times had to correct its story last week. Quote, an earlier version of this article misstated what allows social media firms to remove posts that violate their standards. It is the First Amendment, not Section 230, quote. Now, the Florida court, as you described, was not confused at all. When we sued to block that law on June 30th, the federal court enjoined Florida's law as violating the First Amendment. It intruded on social media's editorial judgment, and it compelled private businesses to host speech they don't want to carry. So if you quote the ruling, I think it's really instructive to James. Quote, the state has asserted that it is on the side of the First Amendment and that the plaintiffs are not. It is perhaps a nice soundbite, but the assertion is wholly at odds with accepted constitutional principles. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law bridging the freedom of speech or the press. And the federal court in Florida went on to block all of the content moderation provisions. So, James, it's more likely that more of your recommended state laws will be blocked by the First Amendment and we'll sue everywhere we need to. You will only be encouraging, therefore, moderation standards that you want to eliminate because you'll simply confirm here what the federal court said, that state governments cannot violate the First Amendment by forcing social media to carry content they don't want to carry. So I'll close by saying that, James, if you really want to create a wide open public square, get busy on that and stop trying to nationalize private social media platforms that are just trying to create and foster the communities that they want to build. So oh, James, let's go to you for two minutes. And I think, you know, one of the key issues here around the content moderation, you know, raising the, the common carrier idea, but, you know, we do have requirements for broadcast. Uh, and it sounds like, is, is that kind of what the idea here is? You, you want uh, more regulation that would permit uh, these platforms be treated as common carriers? What we're looking for is our unalienable free speech rights not to be trampled by entities that deliberately enter capture and then dominate the market for free speech. Free speech does not exist because government benevolently gave it to us for the first time in the First Amendment. Our free speech rights supersede and precede 
the First Amendment. The First Amendment merely affirms that government's not going to encroach upon those un unalienable rights. Now, whether it's the government or it's a multinational corporation that stifles people's free speech rights, either way, that is not permissible. These are entities that have deliberately entered into that market, a market of user-based platforms, uh, and then have decided that rather than simply policing violence and sexual obscenity, now want to tell us that we cannot question government statements about the origins of the coronavirus. We cannot present evidence that hydroxychloroquine may be useful. We can't question what the United Nations tells us on global warming, and we can't share with our friends and neighbors our own beliefs. This isn't a matter of compelling private multinational corporations to say something they don't wanna say. They can say whatever they want. They can paste it at the end of people's comments. But it's like if I were to buy the cell phone tower in my neighborhood, listening to my neighbor's conversations and cut off anything I don't like, I'm sorry, that's just not uh, acceptable in a modern society. This is the same thing. Thanks, James. Steve, how would you respond? And, you know, taking into account that there are many people who feel that their ability to communicate freely on tech platforms, especially social, the dominant social media platforms, has been restricted, either based on viewpoints, whether you're a Palestinian activist or, um, you know, a, a variety of different points of view. Can you respond in two minutes? Thanks, Courtney. As you indicated uh, at, at the beginning, this is a squeeze play. There are elements of our government at the state and federal level who want more content moderation by the social media platforms. And there are elements who would prefer less content moderation, but neither because of the first amendment, neither can impose their will on private platforms like Facebook, Google, and Twitter. They are trying to build communities and they will make value judgments over time in response to new and emerging threats. Who knew the Tide Pod challenge was going to get teenagers attention, right? Who knew that we had to prepare for a pandemic? And frankly, when you think about the kind of speech that they want to force these platforms to carry, when I testified in Texas against a very similar law that Mr. Taylor's been pushing, uh, the only supporters other than Heartland were anti-vaxxers who wanted to be sure they could force Facebook, Google, and Twitter to carry lots of information about the dangers of vaccines to people on social media. And if those platforms don't want to carry that for their own reasons, if it doesn't fit their vision, then people are free to go to other platforms. There are zero barriers to entry to start a new social media platform. Uh, Rumble, Parler, MeWe, they've all been able to achieve millions of subscribers. And it's easy for people to join multiple social media platforms. And you can choose, therefore, to go to one that maybe has a light touch on content moderation. But beware, because the more awful but lawful content that is on a social media platform, the less likely it is for advertisers to want to see their ads displayed to that kind of content. And when the advertisers go away, I don't know who's going to pay to make that free for subscribers. Thank you, Steve. Um, that is the perfect intro to the panel because we actually will be hearing from someone who is representing the advertising industry. So look, this is just a teaser. We could debate this issue for the entire panel, but I'm gonna ask Steve and James to go on mute and we're gonna have a discussion with a group of experts um, because clear, in addition to these two that we've just heard from, because clearly there is no consensus about whether governments can or should regulate content moderation or even what the regulatory framework that should govern these companies is. But as the two sides duke it out and the courts have their say, there are a plethora of other initiatives underway that have arisen in the past few years that are aimed at providing a framework for content moderation through self-regulation. In particular, countering violent extremism online and combating hate speech have given rise to a number of such initiatives, such as the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism or the GIF-CT, the Christchurch Call to Eradicate Terrorism from the Internet, we heard mention of the pandemic and the rise that that's given to efforts to fight disinformation and inaccurate information. So we're going to hear from the panel and then I'm going to invite the audience to submit questions in the chat. I'm watching it um, both in the Q&A as well as the chat. So if you have a specific question, do please put it in the q and I'm going to weave those in to the extent that I can and that they're relevant. Um, and then I am going to, we're gonna hear from all of our panelists. So first, Farzane, uh, if you could turn on your, you've got your video on, great. Uh, you are the Director of Social Media Governance Initiative at Yale Law School, and you're also involved um, in the Christchurch Call Advisory Network, uh, along with myself. We serve on the advisory network, and you've studied this issue for quite some time. Um, 
we heard earlier about, okay, the government wants to regulate content moderation and you know make these rules. Meanwhile, we're seeing that there are all these efforts to figure it out um, while the regulators are getting their house in order. Can you talk about, give us an overview of some of the key content moderation approaches, the models you've seen emerge recently, and what we really need to keep in mind as we assess these models. And take about two or three minutes, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, so we see um, a few emerging trends in governance landscape of platform uh, governance. One is that, and these are my opinion, and of course, it's not going to be inclusive in, within like three minutes. <laughs> so one is that governing, uh, instead of governing pieces of content, uh, we actually can move to governing user behavior. So takedown is not the only answer. And the platforms have been uh, slowly, but uh, surely paying attention to the fact that take takedown might not be as effective as uh, we think. And there is also a return to community governance because in the past um, we had community that uh, communities online would get involved with the governance and um, remove or flag uh, various uh, pieces of content. Um, but then now we see kind of like uh, platforms that are newer, such as like Discord and Nextdoor and, um, and others, even Twitter has an experimental um experimental program called bird watch to give the community not the uh, full power of course uh, but to give the community a choice and um and then the third one is maybe related to number two is the expansion of governance uh by the by including the elite and this i'm not calling them elites, uh, it's not a dirty word. So, but what I, uh, what I mean is that they have like content advisory network, they have safety advisory network. TikTok has abundance of advisory networks, match.com, uh, which runs uh, Tinder also uh, has, has one. And then we get to the uh, multi-stakeholder governance, which is kind of newer um, uh, uh, governance approach that we see and one prime example of it is, as you mentioned, is the Christchurch call, which New Zealand and um, uh, Fr uh, France decided to come up with to eradicate online uh, extremist and violent uh, content. Uh, and but it was in the beginning, it was a bunch of commitments that tech corporations and governments had come up with. But now it has slowly evolved into a multi stakeholder uh, approach. Uh, we have various uh, work streams that we work with. They have uh, we have the advisor network, as you mentioned, which so civil society is active there. And of course, it's non binding. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it, I think. I, my time is up. <laughs> Great. Well, you know, one of the things I think is relevant also to mention is that it's linked with the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism, the GIF-CT, right? And so the GIF-CT was initially an industry-led approach to get rid of essentially ISIS and Al-Qaeda content. It has since expanded um, to now include additional types of extremist and violent content. And they coordinate um, through the use of a hash database, a database of digital fingerprints that link up to the multimedia videos, et cetera, associated with that content. Um, before we move on, what can you tell us a little bit about that governance model, this idea of coordinating content moderation? And, and in this case, it is um, you know, pure take, it is kind of take down or leave up uh, across platforms. And especially when the GIF CT was started by um, Facebook, Twitter, Google, some of the biggest com companies in the world. And now you have much, you know, many smaller companies um, who might just be using that as a way to, you know, shorthand remove uh, content. And as we know from the companies, there are no, there's no actual database of the content. So there's no way to audit what's being removed and whether that's valid or not. Can you just talk briefly about what, what, you know, governance issues that raises? 
Yes, and uh, that uh, is a very bad idea, in my opinion, to uh, uh, not only it reinstates the uh, the big corporation, tech corporations business model, so everybody has to be like them in order to be able to uh, succeed in the market. And then we are we are just going to have multiple uh, Facebook of uh, which which is frightening. Um, it it does that. It also has implications for freedom of uh, expression. Imagine that you are making a mistake in taking one uh, one piece of content uh, down, um, and that mistake is kind of harmonized mistake. Uh, across the platforms, all of them are going to make, uh, make that mistake. And this is what I think if CT uh, should prevent and not really work uh, and, and uh, not really uh, kind of follow that approach. The other um, problem with the hash data uh, database uh, is that the concept of upload filters that uh, we, we've been working on together. Um, you know, they they have this uh, hashed uh, database, and then they also like uh, affect the internet architecture by having uh, the uh, kind of like harmonizing the hash database and also uh, not uh, having like mechanisms for upload filters. But that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Farzane. Um, yes, and I mean for. I, I think for full transparency, um, Farzane and I are on the Christchurch Call Advisory Network. I'm, uh, I, I believe you're also involved with the GIFCT working groups, as am I. I'm on the transparency working groups. So you know, were involved in these efforts to the extent um, which has given us some inside input. Um, and we're going to get to some of the, the issues that presents later on. But I want to turn now to Julia Wono. Uh, you are the executive director of Internet Sans Frontières and a member of the Facebook Oversight Board. And I see we actually have a question here from Eric Botts about how tech companies work with civil society um, to create a code of conduct. And, and I think that the Facebook Oversight Board is a really interesting example of that. Can you tell us, you know, what is this board and its approach to content moderation? Who's involved and is it working? Thank you so much, uh, Courtney, and hello, everyone. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first IGF USA, so I'm particularly excited. Um, so yes, the, the, the Oversight Board is definitely part of all this multifaceted set of solutions that are required on the issue that we're talking about, which is content moderation, especially on social media platforms. And I would even go as, uh, as far as to say that it's a, it's a body an initiative that takes into account two very important features when we, we talk about content moderation now, which is multi-stakeholderism and globality. I apologize, I have some people who wanna get in, but they will, <laughs> they will go away soon. Um, why are these two features important? Well, first of all, because we are operating on a network, uh, which is by definition, interdependent. So there is no way that only one actor of the network will have the, the solutions, sorry, to tackle these very complicated issues. And also globality, why? Well, because those platforms, many of, all of them virtually, are by design uh, intend to be accessible anywhere around the world to any user, any citizen around the world. So this is required to, to uh, understand. I mean, this is these are two very important features right now when we want to do good content moderation. And um, how does the board fit into this, um, you know, this landscape and how do we respond to these two challenges, which are multi-stakeholderism and globality? Well, first of all, we make binding decisions uh, and recommendations on the content moderation decisions that have been taken by Facebook and Instagram, two of the most important social media platforms. Uh, the binding decisions are extremely important because the, the company has to implement them. And then the recommendations, although non-binding, they're an extremely important and powerful tool to force open conversations about Facebook's content moderation decisions and also hold the company accountable because Facebook has to publicly respond to all the recommendations that we make and explain whether or not it will implement it. And if it does not implement it, why it won't do so. So this is extremely important. And one of the reasons that I personally chose to, to join the oversight board. The second, the second thing that I think is important to mention is that is this collaboration between not only the board and the company in this open conversation that I was just mentioning, but also between the board 
the users and civil society organizations in general. Um, how do we do that? Well, one of the ways we do that is through the public comments that we allow users and organizations to submit when we take a case. For instance, uh, as we're speaking today, um, it's the deadline for public comment period that opened for a new case that we accepted. And that involves uh, what something that you were briefly mentioning, referring to Courtney, which is uh, a, a content posted in the frame of the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. It's, it's, it's an extremely important case that will certainly open up a lot of debate. And I really in, encourage everyone here who can, who is interested to submit comments today. Thank and you. Third, oh, sorry. Okay. Nope, that's word. okay. Transparency will publish a report at the end of the year, and we have an implementation working group tracking progress of Facebook on the recommendations we made. Thank you, Courtney. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. That is incredibly helpful. Um, and I, I, you know, one of the things that the that I think Farzne alluded to and that the Facebook Oversight Board illuminates is, you know, there are opportunities to influence content moderation, but you know, it, it's interesting when we were deciding, for example, the committee to protect journalists, are we going to engage with the board? Are we going to, you know, make submissions that is essentially, you know, unpaid labor. It's another body that you then have to, you know, somehow provide input and try to influence and, um, you know, put that capital, whether you're an NGO or a law firm or a private company, I think you guys get submissions from all sorts of folks, but you know, there are, that is a form of unpaid labor for the most, the, one of the wealthiest companies in the world, which I think is an interesting dynamic that uh, some panel should get into, but probably not this one, because I actually want to move on now to Rob Rakowitz, because we heard earlier that, you know, if the, uh, if the advertisers don't like the content that's on the platform, they're going to go off and leave. And we actually see that the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, or GARM, was created at the World Federation of Advertisers um, because I think in part you saw uh, efforts to boycott the platform because of hate speech. You saw advertisers um, trying to pressure for content moderation. And Rob, I want to ask you, you know, first of all, to tell us a little bit more about GARM, because I, I don't think people are that familiar with it. And is it fair to say that GARM harnesses the power of advertisers to influence content moderation policy? And, you know, to, to Julie's point about the globalism and uh, multi-stakeholderism that's needed to like legitimize these efforts, this is very different because it's just the private sector, it's advertising advertisers working directly with pl tech platforms. So give us your thoughts on that, Rob. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for having me. Um, and I think it's really important for us to sort of clarify our creation story and truly what we're actually working on. So um, look, brand safety has been around. Um, so basically brand safety, e.g. the placement of advertising in places where it should not be because it is either sort of not suitable for the brands or it is considered harmful for society or users has been around uh, since, you know, 2004, when you had sort of, you know, social sharing sites of, you know, uh, piracy, pornography, et cetera, et cetera. It's obviously sort of grown and it's grown because of two facets, because one, advertisers have sort of shifted over towards buying audiences not buying content and the marketplace has actually enabled that. Second thing is that you have the rise of UGC based uh, social media networks that have their own policies. Now, what in essence has cre been created therefore is a asymmetry in the marketplace in terms of um, uh, different policies that exist, clarity on policies. And basically we ended up in a situation where um, consumers, users, uh, were, you know, had a, a, a basic right sort of infringed upon, which is the freedom to have an online experience free from harm and hate. And you had advertisers, most importantly, with, in, from my perspective, because I represent advertisers, uh, who were operating in a situation where they didn't have a right to determine where their ads showed up online. Um, GARM was started up uh, prior to um, the live casting of the um, Christchurch massacre. And, um, and it come from sort of personal experience when I was head of media at Mars, where we had a series of incidents on a series of platforms and a series of markets. And we just kept on going into sort of 
the same model, which was a, a, a means of, of, of whack-a-mole, uh, where there was a problem here, you'd whack it down, uh, and then the problem would sort of pop up on a different network in a different way, and the industry wasn't sort of facing into it. And what we decided to do was that we said that that multiple advertisers needed to work together, multiple needed to work together, and more importantly, the platforms needed to work together to actually de define a process and a codification that would allow for the understanding of what is truly harmful content in the view of advertisers, e.g. monetization, not moderation, um, which is a clear distinction in terms of where we operate. Now, in terms of moderation, what we need to have is transparency on moderation uh, processes, which is something that we have been working on. Um, and more, more of what we see is inconsistent enforcement of moderation. So a lot of the things that we're even seeing over in the UK now uh, after the UEFA Cup is just really poor moderation. Because this, when you look at it, it is clear bullying, it is clear racist and hate speech. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the industry continues to falter on this. Um, and it's just, you know, where we've been has been sort of creating standards as well as controls that basically allow for uh, a consistent approach towards what is what is harmful and how does that actually play into monetization that gives brands more visibility, more control. Thank you, Rob. And I, I think it's interesting because um, in the Facebook Oversight Board decision um, on the deplatforming of President Trump from Facebook, they did mention the importance of consistency and, and having uh, rules that you know people can abide by. And it sounds like you know you guys are seeking the same for advertisers. Thank you, Rob. Um, I want to turn finally to our, our final panelist. Alex Fierce, who is the general counsel at Neuralink and was previously head of legal and head of trust and safety at the publishing platform Medium. Uh, Alex, you've also been involved in the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership and the Trust and Safety Professional Association. And you know, when it comes down to it, it's the trust and safety teams who are the ones doing content moderation. Um, the people you described as the judges and the janitors of the internet. Of course, they're also helped by algorithms, which have their own basket of challenges. Um, but what are these new initiatives aiming for when it comes to content moderation? Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Courtney. Um, so I guess, so the, the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, which uh, launched in March and I spent a good amount of time on, was an attempt to, um, in, in a way that is like uh, complementary, but I think different than GiveCT, trying to set the bar and then raise the bar on questions like what what does it look like to for a company or for a startup to have a trust and safety team that does this work with excellence right and it, i think arguably trust and safety um you know whatever one thinks thinks of its existence um is sort of coalescing or maybe by now has coalesced into something that's starting to look like a coherent field or discipline you know <clears throat> For me, as an English major, I suppose it was one of the few things I can do in tech, and so it uh, it it has uh, hit its a phase of maturity where there's questions of rigor that we are trying to uh, arrive at around sort of best practices of what does it look like to have a mature trust and safety team that is um, anticipating risks well associated with any given product or feature. Um, how is it mitigating those risks by working with the product team well, you know, anticipating questions around monetization or around um, effects on communities and, and on the different human impacts? Um, you know, are, are there clear governance documents that are iterated and made available to the public so that it is clear, um, you know, if a platform intervenes, you know, into a piece of content or into somebody's conduct, um, why is that happening? Um, you know, are, are, is the application of the rule being made clear? Is somebody being, being given notice? Um, as you said, what tech tools are you using? Are you, you know, using uh, AI to make proactive decisions on, you know, whether something is going viral and is very harmful um, or using, um, you know, maybe machine learning to flag something to bring it to human attention. And then finally, um, you know, can we arrive at some, some initial best practices around transparency of making clear what it is you're doing of logging things like this and making clear, you know, either through product, um, you know, in the product itself, um, or, and through regularly published reports, how the work is getting done. And the hope here is, I think, several things. One of them, like I said, is to try to um, establish a sense of rigor and consistency of how the work is done without necessarily arriving at consistency of how it gets done at each company. Meaning like, 
companies may have different views on, on hate speech. They may have different definitions of hate speech. They may take different approaches to whether, you know, whether they want to take a light touch or not to mitigating what they see as harms. But maybe we can agree on some best practices about what it looks like to have an appropriately competent group of people who are thinking about the issues and who are, and who are well-trained and who are making their work um, discernible to the public in a way that is still flexible enough um, that, uh, that the content cartel issue that Farzani alluded to, that we don't have companies all making the same decisions and arriving at the same outcomes. We wanna sort of have standards for excellence that nevertheless allow each of the different companies and each of the different products to arrive at potentially really different outcomes um, so that the sort of diversity of the marketplace um, you know, that, uh, that was alluded to earlier um, can be preserved. So, so that um, is sort of a nascent effort right now, but, but um, we're very encouraged by it. And I think it, where it will arrive eventually is you know, having like similar to other corporate social responsibility reporting, um, you know, com social media companies and others having you know, third party you know, assessors come in and you know, sort of like inspect the kitchen and say like, is the trust and safety work here being done with excellence? Is it being invested in? Um, is it meeting these standards where then we can start having a more maybe trusting conversation about what, what work is getting done, how it's getting done, and what people's views are on how to improve it. Thank you, Alex. Um, it's, it's so interesting because I feel like I've heard this term consistency used by several of the panelists, and it's not something that we have talked about a lot. We see it, I think, embedded, but it seems to be coming to the fore uh, more often. And, and I would say even, you know, in the in the Florida law and the, the suit brought against, you know, the, some of the opinions about how um, government should or shouldn't regulate is because of a feeling of inconsistency uh, which can give rise to feelings of unfairness. And we have several questions um, in the Q&A from, um, from Milton Mueller, a esteemed uh, colleague and an and academic, and from Amir Mokabari. I'm sorry, I don't know who that is, but, but kind of several questions about moderation at the international level. Can can one set of principles um, really scale across jurisdictions um, with Facebook? Can there be an inclusive board to decide what's appropriate across, you know, the thousands of languages, countries, et cetera? Um, and, and, you know, the how jurisdiction and legal frameworks uh, apply. So I want to first go um, to Julie regarding the Facebook Oversight Board, because I also know that this is something that I think uh, you guys were very cognizant of in the formation of the board, but ultimately Facebook created the board. Um, what is this, this idea of content moderation at scale across boundaries? Is it possible? Should, is that how it should work? I mean, it's, it, we are in an interesting time where we can try experiments, definitely. And that's why this moment is particularly uh, interesting, I find. First of all, to respond to... Um, I think Milton's, Mueller's excellent question. Um, first, the, the board itself is international. So we are 20 members so far, aiming to be 40, um, who are coming from different backgrounds, geographically, professionally, socially, gender, et cetera, um, on the one hand. On the other hand, we are of being conscious of that globality and being a product of, the, of that globality as well, we do make a lot of recommendations that uh, encourage the platform as much as possible to take into account the context and to rely on expertise that knows the context. This is not impossible. It's a question of political and financial will. There have been lots of um, revelations, including very recently, that explain from insiders of Facebook, former insiders that explain that the company simply makes choices that are marketly, I mean, from a market perspective, more interesting and invest more in certain regions of the world compared to others because it's more interesting from a market perspective. This logic should end, at least that's the opinion of the board and that's what we've told Facebook at several occasions. And the third thing that I would like to respond to that is that we, when we make our decisions, we consult with local experts. We have policy briefs uh, that help us understand better the context of the publication that we're that we'll have to oversee, and also we uh, commission commission translations. I mean, anything really that can help us have a better understanding of the context. But of course, it's not enough. It's just <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, Julie. And I mean, you know, the fact that Facebook is such a wealthy company and has the resources to devote to that sort of work is really important. And, and Rob, I want to ask you about GARM because I think that's, that's, you know, a similar question there, right? It is a global mm-hmm. alliance. You have brands and, and platforms from around the world. Um, how do you see this scaling? And, you know, is this the right way to decide what's allowable? And I will just add, you know, from my own perspective, working in journalism, are you guys looking at secondary effects on content moderation yeah, and, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, look, and it, and like, look, it's, it's monetization hundred percent. Right. Because like, I think everything sort of that we've seen is that bluntness is actually the enemy of diversity. So I'll give you a very sort of personal story, you know, when in, in my days at Mars, um, we had an incident sort of roll up on YouTube in the UK where drill rap became a sudden phenomenon. And if folks on uh, in the audience don't, um, you know, aren't aware of what drill rap is, but it's a specific subgenre, specifically in the UK of rap that advocates for violence against police. Um, and um, there were cases of that content being monetized, and it was, you know, it was profanity and it was incitement to violence. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, scenarios where it was monetized and then all of a sudden brands run, run away and sort of say ban all rap, right? Because it becomes a sort of vote of confidence in terms of moderation and a failure of the platform to properly moderate and monetize. So then all of a sudden you end up when the, uh, the opposite pendulum swing where you drop all rap. Now you sort of just think through that through logically in terms of DE and I, and all of a sudden you stop speaking to certain um, uh, parts of the uh, of the consumer landscape, which is not a good thing. So, and we've saw Sorry, this again. E, E, and I standing for diversity. So diversity, equity, and inclusion. So all of a sudden you end up with a media plan that's white, um, which is not a good thing. And not any brand manager would tell you or CMO would tell you that they would want that. Um, so in essence, what we've seen is like blunt is not a good thing in terms of blo- in terms of content categorization uh, for moderation and then also monetization. Um, and uh, so I, I would actually say that, you know, the more specificity that you actually have in the marketplace from a sell side, e.g. on a platform, ad tech provider, as well as agency, as well as uh, 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 brand, you actually have the choice. Um, And that is what we're trying to do is restore visibility, restore choice. And fundamentally, if you believe in free market economics, then we start to reward the right sort of content, the content that's right for brands uh, uh, individually, um, which is a good thing. Um, So so I think that that sort of, you know, uh, illustrates, you know, really what we're, what we're, you know, the, the tension therein in terms of you know monetization, specific pieces of content, as well as um, diversity. So we're yeah. not looking for homogeneity at, by any stretch of the imagination. It's actually specificity, which will allow for diverse voices to rise to the top. Thank you, Rob. That was really helpful. Um, I think at the root of some of these, uh, we talked about transparency being important, um, about who gets to be part of this body and what the kind of implications of joining and, and exclusion are. Um, Farzane, you characterize the Christchurch call as government's attempt to quasi-regulate social media platforms, not through legislative efforts, but through opaque cooperation with tech corporations. Could you expand a bit on that? And then also in light of what we've heard about kind of private sector, private sector cooperation, as with the GARM. Um, we've heard about, you know, the, the trust and safety um, in kind of ent- professionalization of, of this sector getting together, which is still ultimately private sector. And of course, you know, the Facebook Oversight Board um, and the GIF CT, both of which are private sector driven. Talk a little bit about the concerns with quasi-governmental regulation, but then also you know, are these other models, do they pose the same challenges? Are they better? Analyze this for us. Um, so that piece 
I wrote, I think, around a year and a half ago. <laughs> so uh, a year ago. And uh, yes, and at the time it was, um, we were worried that this is going to end up being a quasi-regulator uh, body, body that would uh, actually work with the tech corporations uh, and uh, leave everyone else um, out uh, of the discussion and come up with binding measures uh, that and it, this is because uh, of course in the beginning um, and not uh, because of malintent or anything like that but uh, uh, New Zealand and the French uh, government wanted to move really fast and when you want to move fast uh, you forget that there are, uh, uh, there has been like a uh, experts and uh, civil society and academics that have been working on these issues. So uh, getting into um, uh, the room with the tech corporations, they came up with this uh, set of commitments, which uh, frankly, if you read the commitments, they are not very, uh, from the standpoint of human rights, freedom of expression, and um, uh, uh, there are various uh, concerns about it. So if uh, but then uh, it, uh, the New Zealand government worked with us, as you know, uh, with the advisor network, and uh, we came up with these uh, work streams to be able to uh, kind of come up with these policy positions, I guess, and they are not binding at the moment. However, uh, when uh, the problem is that when we actually want to make this uh, binding, or if we if we think that this should be binding, then there will be a lot of legitimacy issues at stake. The who is deciding, why are you deciding, how are you deciding? And the government, um, to the New Zealand uh, credit, they, they did try to uh, kind of be inclusive. And this is a multi-stakeholder uh, approach, but um, there will be a lot of um, a lot of considerations if the policies be, uh, want to become binding. Because to be honest, we are not really involved with the <laughs> with the very important decisions, and uh, we are trying. But uh, but then the global issue is that how about when the di dictators want to get involved with, with the um, Christchurch uh, call initiative? Are we going to have them uh, like be on equal footing with the rest of us? Can we discriminate? And I don't think the answer is yes, we can discriminate. I don't think so. In the international setting, unfortunately, we have to work with the uh, with the dictators, and that is the problem. Um, and uh, the other solution is to say no, we just want to work with the West and the democratic uh, countries, which is not a solution. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, sorry, do I have time to address the other one? Uh, yes. uh, okay. Yeah. okay. So for the for the trust and um, uh, safety, what I uh, want to hear more in our discussions is who are we talking about when we keep saying that oh we need to protect them, we need to uh, take content down, we need to bring who are we bringing this trust and safety to, and um, and look at it from the user uh, perspective. We uh, I think that what we need to do is we need to put the uh, users at the center, not necessarily um, and not necessarily have a bottom up process because it is not it, it does it might not uh, scale, but has like a, have a hybrid one that the trust and safety works with the user to empower them because they understand uh, better the setting that they're in, the context they're in, like uh, people that live in a uh, dictatorship and they have like channels, they know they know and understand the security issues that they might face and also the uh, hate speech and uh, other factors, they understand that better than a uh, person at uh, trust and safety in San Francisco. Um, so uh, I, I think that we need to uh, bring the user and, and I think trust and safety departments are uh, trying to do that as well.
Great. Thank you, Farzane. Um, I, I want to go now to James, um, since we've kind of talked about all these self-regulatory approaches and, and different types of collaborations. And we also have a question from Michelle Ferry, who's the founder of Trollbusters. And um, she, you know, talking about the, the algorithmic harms that come from coordinated action of blocking and sharing imposter content and the importance um, of not silencing some voices, but wanting to silence others. Um, you know, and, and, and similarly, you know, Farzane raising the fact that, you know, people live in very different types of contexts. So we do know that around the world, there are coordinated state actions being taken against um, women politicians, women journalists, uh, journalists and politicians who aren't women, um, but but especially, you know, women in any sort of public figure, uh, public, public um, role. And I think that one of the, you know, there was a very diverse array of reactions to the deplatforming decision. Um, so I, I guess I want to hear from you. Do you think that the common carrier approach, you know, addresses this? Have you heard anything today that you feel like um, would be helpful in mitigating uh, some of the concerns that that you have raised and, and, and addressing, you know, content moderation here? Great question. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I think that the common carrier uh, discussion is very useful. I think it's very applicable. Um, state legislators sometimes will bring it up by name, others will be discussing the concept. The reality is, and we could talk about how people have other options, but um, the three top social media companies here have captured 93% of the market and 98% among the top five social media companies. That is a dominant market share. That is a dominant monopoly. And these companies work together. So, and then Parler comes along and Steve had mentioned earlier Parler. And, uh, and I was telling folks a year ago, hey, trust the market, we'll have an alternative. And what happened? Parler got destroyed, absolutely destroyed. And it is merely a shell of what it once was. Now, we're supposed to say that when tech companies, just a few, five of them controlling 98% of the market, that, that when they make a deliberate decision to enter this sphere, to control it, to dominate it, and then to suppress free speech, let's just sit patiently because maybe someday we'll have some alternative. So, but, but let, me, let, me, let me, but James, I want to then ask you, so you heard, you know, these, these initiatives like GARM um, that bring together the industry players to coordinate even further. Would, would that, is that, do you see that as problematic? Um, right. Should that be banned under this approach? And I apologize for my long preamble as I was just going there, but I, I'm actually a little more concerned uh, than I was before. Because I don't think the problem, certainly not the problem that I have and, and my friends on Facebook uh, and elsewhere, the problem isn't that standards are being applied inconsistently, that somebody got away with this and somebody else didn't. The problem is that there seems to be this notion among the tech giants that dominate social media that they can and should become the arbiters of all truth. They can and should become the infallible arbiters of what is and isn't hate speech. They can and should be able to say what people should be able to share with each other. Now, in the question and comment section, uh, somebody posted a very, very uh, astute comment about our question about are there technologies that can be developed or are being developed that allow the user to apply such filters? And I think that's wonderful. That's where we should be going. Indeed, in Section 230, in the section that talks about Congress explicitly stating what its policy is, here's a quote. It's the policy of Congress, quote, to encourage the development of technologies which maximize user control over what information is received. So I'd rather see us, instead of focusing on how we can all get together and as the god kings of speech and truth and everything else on the internet, instead devise ways that free speech can be encouraged and people on their own can set their own standards. Thank you. Thanks for that, James. Alex, um, I want to go to you with that because, you know, Medium is a, a user generated, I know you're not there anymore, but, you know, you were um, user generated content. We've got models like Wikipedia, which engage in a very different form of content moderation on the platform. Um, when you hear James talking about, and, and the question um, in the Q&A about, you know, crowdsourcing or user generated content moderation, can, can you respond to that as somebody who worked, you know, on I think at a platform that initially didn't have a trust and safety, but then, you know, you guys have to figure, figure out how to address content moderation. Is that feasible at scale? Um, can, can, is that, you know, doable for every com company? Yeah. So I think, I think a helpful way to think about it is that what, 
all the different forms of like content moderation and forms of human risk that we think about. It's really, it's not a problem. It's really about a hundred problems sort of yoked together under one category that we're thinking of as like different types of harm. So for example, there's, and each of these solutions may work to a point and any, any, any holistic solution is probably going to draw on most or all of them. So for example, um, this principle of subsidiarity that like, oh, we should push to the edge as much as possible, let the user control their own experience as much as possible, because it's really, it, we should empower them, create tools, create ways for somebody to tailor their own social media experience. And then you should not, you don't necessarily need a corporate or a central authority to do that thing. That works fine in some instances, you know, if you're having an exchange with somebody you'd rather not talk with. But if a bunch of strangers are raising a mob to send the SWAT team to your house, controlling your own experience doesn't do a lot for you, right? Similarly, decentralization, and I know everything's better on the blockchain, but there are instances in which decentralizing decision making so that you can have a plurality of different stakeholders or different assessors making a decision about something and also finding less binary solutions so that the thing is not simply leave it up or take it down, but something might be have more friction to reach it or be more obscure or have some other piece of uh, information next to it. I think these are all sort of like promising to their own extents. Um, and, and, and I think people who do the work sort of try to cobble together different solutions that are appropriate for the exact type of harm and the exact type of issue that people are feeling. Because really what we're talking about is like a very disparate number of human conditions that are yoked together under content moderation. I, and I would say like content moderation is really just the problem of other people and their expression. Um, and there are myriad forms in which this take and various of these solutions will be helpful. None of them is gonna be a panacea. Um, and and as, a, as a final thing, I just wanted to recommend to folks as you, you know, as you study and, and like become, um, you know, experts on this, for anybody who has never moderated a group, if you really, I think the, the best thing you can do for yourself is as you're putting pen to paper about this, start a Facebook group or a subreddit or a discord with your hundred closest friends and colleagues and go moderate it and see how, how it goes. Um, because I think one of the things that you'll learn is that uh, lots of folks want speech that is they don't like moderated and they like their own very true and very just speech to be not moderated. And the fact that we are all stuck in our own uh, skins and sometimes object, you know, universalize our own experience is part of what causes these very human problem, you know, the very human problems of the human condition and expression to feel like things that can be solved by one or another form of tech. I think they'll all be mitigated to some extent, like a crime rate or something else. We can make them better, but the notion that there will be one or several things that can simply solve all these problems, I think, is a misreading of how human beings and expression work. Thanks. Thanks for that, Alex. And, you know, it does make me think that, um, you mentioned, you know, putting the onus on the user. We haven't really talked much about online harassment, but that is something that is, I think, always um, front and center in many of our minds. I mean, just even thinking about the engagement, you know, on social media and advance of this panel, uh, you know, one of the things that right now I'm working with the International Women's Media Foundation and a coalition of 30 organizations that are trying to figure out how to address online violence against women journalists online, which is not just about that individual, but also about the impact that has on the public's right to know and the public interest in having um, journalistic coverage. And one of the, I think, pushbacks on the tech firms that we're constantly making is, yes, you need to give the users tools to empower their ability to curate their experience. But if you hear from, for, for example, Maria Ressa, um, one of the world's leading journalists who is the co-founder of Rappler in the Philippines facing um, almost a dozen charges and up to hundred years in jail. Um, she has been the victim or the target of online harassment at a scale that is not moderatable by her, by her newsroom, et cetera. And we hear that from women uh, journalists a lot that the scale and scope is, is very, very impossible to deal with. And so, I think there is, is tension that I'm hearing emerge on this panel between wanting to devolve content moderation and decision making over what content people see and get access to to the individual, but also the tension, you know, where there are some aspects like terrorism, where I think in general people seem to be less um, find that less problematic to have coordination around. I think, with the exception of you know people who are working in um, countries where 
uh, activist content is regularly flagged as terrorist content. But, you know, for the most part, people don't want terrorist content online. But there's this huge, vast middle. Um, Steve, I want to come to you with a question about, you know, I think that the community has felt for a long time, or not the community, there's no a uh, community, there are many communities, but um, many people have felt that there is not enough being done by the tech platforms to address the objectionable con content, which includes harassment, it includes terrorism, it includes extremist violence, et cetera. Um, and that we want or need regulators and policymakers to step in and provide uh, some impetus for them to actually do more because they're not doing enough. How do you address that? Simplest way, Courtney, is if the government makes a particular kind of speech and harassment illegal, then all unlawful activity is acted upon right away for fear that the platforms themselves could become liable. And even Section 230 says nothing about criminal law. So the, the point here is that if the government wanted to say that Holocaust denial is illegal, you'll take a look at Europe and nearly all the nations in Europe make that an illegal form of speech. It isn't in the United States, partly because of the First Amendment and Congress hasn't enacted something like that. Harassment in the U.S. is an awfully old statute that really only includes credible threats of physical harm. We would need to expand that definition to cover something more than just credible threats of physical harm in order to capture harassment as illegal activity. But if you can't do that, the only thing left is to raise concerns to the social media companies, my members, and they respond because they want to keep advertisers and users happy. That's all we do is bring advertisers and users together in an effort to create and build a business. So uh, the trick is that when we do that and we take action, we need to do so with our own judgment, try to be transparent and accountable, but with our own judgment. And that is inevitably going to create people that have a have a problem with it. People like James who have a problem with certain decisions that are made on pulling down misinformation. The anti-vaxxers won't like if we try to re regulate medical disinformation. So I think we are in a bad place here where we're being squeezed from both sides. Uh, keep up the squeezing and work the refs, but understand that there's our forces pushing the other way as well. Thank you, Steve. Um, Farze, I want to ask you, you know, uh, one of the kind of key principles of legitimacy um, in these initiatives, whether we're talking about, you know, government or private sector, or any sort of coordination here is transparency. And we're seeing, I think, a proliferation of um, recognition about transparency, transparency reporting, et cetera. Um, within the industry um, around different efforts, but much less so in the government. Where do you think transparency, what does transparency mean in this sense? And do you think that that is part of the solution to content moderation uh, legitimacy? Uh, I am very skeptical about transparency nowadays because I believe that, and uh, Daphne Keller actually has a very good uh, blog about transparency and how we how we should actually ask transparency uh, ask for transparency from these tech corporations because frankly a hundred page report uh, which is uh, quite uh, vague about the content uh, moderation and content takedown is not uh, um, does not really give me enough information and um, might not be very very effective and also transparency is important to who are we asking this uh, transparency for? Are we asking it for the scholars and the researchers that want to uh, look at this and help the platforms to come up with solutions? Or are we looking uh, at uh, transparency from the user uh, point of view, the community's uh, point of view, that why, what do you mean by this action? Why did it happen? Not that I have some policy, okay, yeah, of course I put it on, on the website, but it's like like around a thousand pages <laughs> and uh, so but then what will happen to my content and why it's happening so that's another transparency that we need to also uh, also uh, tackle um, at the moment, the transparency that we see um, uh, the, the tech corporations, the approach that they take to uh, transparency is more about enforcement, is more about how, why do I, uh, well, not even why, it's like this is the content I've taken down, this is how, how many I've taken down, and then they have 
different uh, things and they call diff uh, similar things different um, uh, things like, <laughs> you know, one, one calls it like a, a terrorist content and the other one says that, no, this is like harmful. And we don't even see that. So there are problems with the transparency reporting acro across the platforms. And transparency will bring legitimacy if it's actually effect it can be effectively used by the researchers, by the users, by the government to come up with policies and uh, solutions and kind of inform themselves. I think um, your your response is uh, as always very um, important and and. It also highlights the fact that we often talk about transparency primarily with respect to the tech platforms, but not enough with respect to the governments. And I see another you know, point from Milton about the very real prospect of state private actor collusion, where the government launders its censorship decisions by working with or pressuring private actors behind the scenes. And I think that is something that um, this that is one of the reasons that I was very interested in in you know having this panel. IGF, um, you know, my colleague Rick Lane, who helped helped um, organize this as well, one of the core organizers, really putting this at the center is. We also need to think about the transparency of government actions and how we open up all of this so that there is greater level of legitimacy. Um, I think that internet referral units, for example, we don't have anyone here representing internet referral units, but that is a very real example of um, things where there is a lack of transparency because on the tech company side, they don't report internet referral units as government referrals. Um, and on the government side, Governments are not producing transparency reports about their interactions with state with uh, with tech platforms, and I think, I guess we'd all like to see that. I would think. Um, is there anyone anyone on the panel who doesn't think government should be doing transparency reports? Please speak up. Okay. Um, I have a. I mean, I think they should, but they will never do that. And they read. The, there are two words that they use: national security. You know, because in their uh, law enforcement, and they always, uh, the law enforcement, you, you see how they cooperate with Apple, uh, especially I've been uh, studying it. And um, uh, it's, it's very uh, tricky. And this is because of the culture of, we have kind of bought into that these governments are doing uh, us a favor and protecting us so they can just hide things from us for national security. Let me go, Rob and Julie. I want to ask you: Have your entities been, uh, you know, been pressured by government or received, you know, communications from governments asking for, you know, any sort of particular policies or, or content to be removed or, or addressed? Rob and then Julie. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, look, we, we've we've engaged with uh, the government. Um, in, in various markets uh, where there's been a request to sort of understand and learn more. Um, generally, the, you know, the, the way that we've been perceived and the way that we truly operate is, is industry self-regulation. Um, you know, there, we haven't gotten to the point where we're looking at certification just yet. Um, however, you know, we are trying to come up with, you know, better visibility so you understand what you're getting into which in essence should be in everybody's um, interest. So we, we've gotten you know, good reception with the European Commission. Uh, we've gotten good reception with um, uh, UK's Ofcom, um, as well as you know, various um, parts of, of the US. I mean, granted, the US is highly partisan about the issue, um, France as well. Um, uh, so I, I think everybody realizes that we're trying to push things in the right direction where there's more transparency in business to business interactions. Um, which, in essence, um, you know, sort of breaks down a bit of a, you know, non-transparent and, and opaque marketplace. Okay. And before I go to Julie, Rob, do you also meet with civil society in yes, the same we way? Great. We do. Um, we have a handful of NGOs um, that we consult um, at a global level as well as a local market level as we're looking at sort of quote unquote solutions or standards um, because the last thing that we want to do is end up having a whole bunch of advertising people operating in a bit of an echo chamber with zero sort of input um, you know that's that's something that we we strive to to make sure that we get out of our echo chamber thanks rob and julie same question to you about uh kind of government influence or intervention well 
any any Facebook or Instagram user can appeal to the board. So, I mean, we haven't received taken a case that involves a uh, a public official. I mean, upon his or her request, we did have a case involving a request about uh, the former U.S. president's account, but a request from Facebook. But so far, we haven't taken a case involving a request from a government. But it's theoretically any user, Instagram or Facebook. But what I would like to, sorry. Well, just just to follow up, do you, um, have you seen submissions into the consultation process from government entities? Um, uh, from memory, no, Th those documents, those submissions are, are very public. So everyone here can, can consult them. But uh, what I do remember is that we have received submissions from uh, international organizations, uh, including special rapporteurs, UN special rapporteurs. I believe also uh, memory again. I mean, yes. Okay, thanks. And you wanted to make another point? Go ahead. Yes, about uh, government transparency. I, I think it, it, there have been some interesting examples, although not all of them have come uh, into effect yet. I'm thinking, for instance, about France's law against hate speech. So half of the law was completely dismissed by the Constitutional Court, which was a great thing because there were very questionable provisions there. But one thing that was interesting in that law was the so the creation, first of all, of a regulator who was who is here in France to make sure that um, hate speech is being addressed by, by platforms. Uh, but not only, I mean, how does this regulator do that is by auditing, first of all, how the law itself is effective. How how many times the, 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 the said hate speech law has been, um, you know, put forward and in asking, although that part has been dismissed. But anyway, what I want to say is that there are interesting uh, baby steps towards government entities self uh, assessing the efficiency of the measures that and the laws that they adopt. And I think this is, yes, this is interesting, not widespread enough, unfortunately, but quite interesting. Thank you. Well, we are coming. Alex, did you want to jump in on this? Just briefly. And, and I say this partly as somebody who's, who's dealt with governments in, as they've made these requests. I think it's totally wild that governments, especially democratic governments, do not have a publicly accessible database of every single request they've ever made. It's baffling to me that they don't. Um, with subpoenas, for example, if we received a subpoena for user data, we would absolutely tell the user unless uh, we had a gag order, which prosecutors increasingly seek. And so there's questions there about uh, the government role in transparency. The other thing I just wanted to mention is simply that um, when you talk about the nitty gritty of day-to-day -day transparency, um, it would be wonderful in some ways to publish a log of all the decisions that get made and all the takedown requests, but I think um, part of the, the challenge of sitting in the position of the platform is, re is realizing that all these content moderation and transparency issues are in tension with privacy law, where your user's data is sacrosanct. And if somebody says, please take down this piece of content because this person is abusing me, and then you make that pub communication public, and in some instances, maybe you have to make their address public, there's a million ways that I think the, the sort of uh, overlap between people's privacy rights, which are sacrosanct now to folks who are at the platforms, and the different transparency demands of the public and the government. And you know, for some folks who want to enforce a court-like standard for that, um, the number of detailed ways that those need to be worked out are sort of myriad, and I would say uncontemplated by I think a lot of the by, by a lot of stakeholders who tend to either care about one issue or the other, but not the interaction in this case between transparency and privacy. That's a great point. Thanks, Alex. And I and I think we've definitely heard that, for example, at the GIF CT and, and the Christchurch call, um, where you know companies are referring to the EU's global um, data protection regulation GDPR as an excuse for why they can't, for example, create a database of the content that's linked to the hashed um, information in their database or um, preventing them from, for example, um, submitting information on takedowns to the Lumen database, which is uh, a collective run out of, you know, a, a nonprofit kind of endeavor to, to try to make some of this more transparent. So um, I do see that we are hitting up on time, um, but I also think there's been a ton of engagement. I see we still have 104 people on the call. So I would like to invite every panelist to give us your one key takeaway that you want people to think about when they think about how we should regulate 
uh, content moderation, whether you're thinking about that from a government regulation, self-regulation, co-regulation, et cetera. What is kind of one of the one key principles that, uh, that everyone should keep in mind? I'm going to go back to the beginning and start with James and please keep your answers short so we can get people um, to the happy hour. So James, please. All right, thank you, Courtney. My advice would be in most cases, do not do so. Uh, there is no need for content regulation in the vast majority of cases. Uh, where there is a need, Section 230 has mapped them out and gives Steve and his uh, colleagues there all the political cover they need to protect against violence, sexual obscenity, et cetera. Um, so yeah, if you're getting away from those topics, don't be, don't be making decisions on political factors, on what you think is true or not true regarding science or whatever it may be. Let the users decide. Thanks, James. Uh, to you, Steve. The way users will decide is they'll be able to choose among platforms that have differing approaches to try to keep their community safe, keep their advertisers and users happy. We need to encourage innovation and experimentation by the platforms. And fortunately, they're protected from government action when they do that. And they're protected from a lot of lawsuits by Section 230. Now, at the same time, I do think the platforms should adopt new principles and standards to be transparent about what they're community standards are. They should be accountable for decisions they make and they should uh, be, have a process of appeals. Maybe not something as grand and global as the Facebook oversight board, but everyday decisions made at Twitter and YouTube, they ought to be able to give people an opportunity to appeal the decision and learn why their content was taken down. Thank you, Steve. Farzaneh. I think that we need to be very objective when we talk about objectionable content and talk about what sort of harm it has actually caused and measured and go away from punitive uh, measures, take down blocking and uh, sanctioning people and govern their behavior without just taking down their content. Thank you. All right, um, Rob. Uh, yeah, I think that the um, topic of uh, regulation is a, a sticky one. I, I think that uh, a lot of the uh, platform, uh, a lot of the panelists um, have, have sort of pointed to it. So, you know, if anything, it's enlightened regulation, avoid part of partisan interference. I think that's the big thing uh, looking at the US market. Uh, but there's got to be a clear understanding of, of what is harm and making sure that we steer the internet, which is a beautiful place, away from it. Thank you. Julie. Uh, I would say, like I started, multi-stakeholderism, making sure everybody has a sit at the table and a word to say about content moderation. Um, and the second thing is not losing sight of the globality of the platform, of the network, and of the issues that, that affect it. Uh, otherwise, I completely agree with Rob, we might lose this beautiful space uh, that the internet is and the borders, borderlessness of that beautiful space. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And Alex? Yes. Um, I mean, I think we are all just, we are just beginning to grapple, grapple with the implications of issuing over a billion printing presses and over a billion movie studios to the people of the world and the means for distributing them at scale very quickly. And I think technology and platforms are maybe the most visible manifestation of the novelty of this and the ways that we are interacting with each other at scale. But I think I also encourage folks to consider where a lot of these problems are, uh, as I said, problems of human expression. And at the end of the day, um, being human is not a problem to be solved. It is a condition to be managed. And I think we're on that road. Thank you, Alex. Um, I personally have found this a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much to the panelists for, you know, really engaging in discussion and, and keeping your responses short enough that we could have, I think, a really dynamic debate. And um, that's not a little thing when we have six really interesting, um, informed people. I want to recognize that, you know, this really focused only on social media, on the content layer, but there are these same questions about, you know, going down the stack, you know, mentioned earlier about, you know, denying access access to say web hosting or that sort of thing. So, you know, this is a multifaceted um, issue. We only touched on a small amount of it. Uh, there are many, many ways to follow up on this, but I think that some of the key things that we're hearing coming out of here is the importance about 
legitimacy, that legitimacy we can get through forms of transparency, but that those have to be meaningful and inclusive, um, and they need to include a variety of different actors. We heard about the importance of multi-stakeholderism, about you know, including the voices of the people affected, the users, the people who do the moderating, um, the companies and the officials who are responsible for creating um, you know, a regulatory environment that facilitates expression and privacy. So I want to thank all of our panelists. I wanna thank our audience and I wanna thank IGF USA for putting on this panel and uh, please give yourself a round of applause and join us for a virtual happy hour. Hopefully next year we'll be in person.